welcome to another exciting and interesting edition of your favorite program. So, lots of you have been talking about, you know, uh, some television stations showing photographic movies, particularly on Friday, Saturday, Sundays, even after 10 p.m. Well, this afternoon, we are here to focus on this particular issue. We want to find out how do we ensure that we sanitize our airwaves? What will be the role? of one, the NMC, but particularly of the Ministry of Information also, because uh, they were also petitioned by these two journalists. When we return after this short break, I'll be introducing my guest for this afternoon, and then we'll begin our deliberations. I'm Winston Amwa, and this is Hot Issues. All right, so welcome back from the short break, and thanks for staying with us. Now, my guest this afternoon is the Minister in Charge of Information, Honourable Mustafa Hamid. Good afternoon, and Good thank afternoon. you very much for joining us. Pleasure so tell us, how's it been? I mean, ever since you moved from private life into public life, you know, per se, as Minister of Information. Well, you know that um, public life, it's, it's a difficult one. Mm. It's, it's, it's not an easy matter. You, apart from the mandate and job that you are given by the President to do, you are also basically responsible for the life of every Ghanaian because people would come to you, you know, with all sorts of uh, issues that you have to help to resolve and so on. And you juxtapose that with your own family commitments and your personal pursuits in life and so on. So in public life, you are basically juggling about four different balls, which you have to try and keep all of them in the air. And, and it's a difficult matter. but. We have a human spirit that 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 survives, so we are we are trying to endure. Mm. And so far, any key achievement that you, you can talk about ever since you became minister? Well, in the Ministry of Information, when we came, we set out um, together with my deputies that we were going to refocus the Ministry of Information and make it development driven. You know that we were going to focus more on development communication and and to try and clean the image of the ministry and take it away from the perception that the ministry of information is a propaganda wing of governments mm. you know and that it is the place where people attack other people who are opponents of government where people uh, manufacture stories, people, you know, there's a lot of negativity that clouds ministries of information, not just in Ghana, but perhaps, you know, in every country that you have such a ministry. So we thought that the first focus is to clean it and refocus. We believe that this far, we, we've done that. We've brought some sanity, some credibility to the voices that mm -hmm. emanate. Um, from the Ministry of Information. Um, we've started what we call the National Policy Summits, where we want to bring all Ghanaians together, you know, around certain core issues that affect the development of our country, so that the conversations that we are having in this country are more consensus-driven than if you want division driven in other words that we we identify the things that are common to us as Ghanaians and to common to our aspirations you know rather than always insulting each other and dividing ourselves and saying these people are this this is that this is that we did a very successful one around okay. the economy um this was in may i think between yes, may, may. may 15 may 16. Uh, it was very successful. People from business, government, private sector, everywhere came around to discuss issues of the national economy. Certain suggestions were made, proposals were made as to how we can improve our economy and also our energy issues. Those issues have been handed over to the minister's consent and hopefully they'll be working at them, you know, perhaps for us to have answers in the next summit. In July, we hope to organize the second in the series of the National Policy Summit, mm. this time around the issues of trade. Because you know that the one district, one factory promise is perhaps our biggest, if you want, uh, weapon or tool for industrialization, development, and for curing 
our employment uh, deficits. And so we want in, in, in July for the Ministry of Trade to come and to tell us where we are with the program of ensuring... But I believe you know where we are, um, I mean, where the government is. You, you should know. Well, I know, but it where is important we? that where we are is that right now in the national budget for 2017, mm -hmm. Um, government has earmarked, I think, about 547 million CDs. I think you know, 456 million. Four, 456 yeah. for the rollout of the program. Um, a secretariat has been set up specifically to deal with the business of the, of the one district, one factory program. Um, a lot of interested parties have enlisted, you know, because you know that this is a public private sector driven yeah. project it is not as if government is going to entirely put its money uh, into the project we we are inviting private people um, the various projects around the country that's around which these factories can be built have also all been been identified and and ironed out so the ministry of trade will come next month and tell us that beyond these um, frameworks and the foundations that have been laid, they would perhaps give us timelines on when these projects will come to fruition, what are the type of projects, where they are going to be, and for the private sector people to also come in and tell us so far what it is or, and how they have been able to buy into mm. the project. But, but, but and, I believe the type so of on. factories are already known. The type of factories we want to build as a country, we know them, don't we? Yes, we do. We do in terms of the raw material mm. that is available in every corner of the country. So we know, so we know the factories we're building in every, every district, for instance. Do we yes, know what that? I'm saying is that the factories are going to be built based on the resources that mm. are inherent in every district. And that's why we say that the projects have been identified. This is what we call the project. So, for example, if we know that in the northern region, for example, mango. Is, is an important resource for the people, that the people produce mango, that there is shea butter, that there is guinea fowl, that there is this. These are all the projects that are going to serve as the bedrock on which these factories will be built in order to leverage the local resources that the people have. So how is it going to be? Would government, for instance, invest, say, okay, so I'm putting $51 million in here, and I expect you to bring the rest. I have saved... 20%, you have 80%. How, how is it going to be like? That's what I'm saying, that all of these details would be given us by the Ministry of Trade. Mm -hmm. If I begin to sit here and begin to talk like I'm the Minister for Trade, you know, the Minister for Information it, it doesn't do every minister's work. That's why I'm saying that the, the component, I know the money that has been mm -hmm. devoted, the public knows. Yeah, but as to how... The, every district, what they will get. That's the business of the minister. Okay. For well, but the president in, in, in sending, uh, uh, you know, your name to parliament said yeah. as my minister of information. Yeah. And so, I'm, I'm sure when we need information, we can always come to you. But well, let's move but on. That's, that's the point I'm making. Yes. But you don't, you don't pretend as minister for information to do every minister's job. Okay. I'm not sure that's also the job of the <laughs> minister for information. All right. So, uh, let's move on. What do you make of television stations showing pornography at night? Well, there are things that are offensive to our culture, mm -hmm. to public morality, and to people's sense of decency. Um, pornographic material is adult material. Mm -hmm. And more specifically, it is private adult material. It is material that adults can access in, in private. It is not meant in our circumstances for public show and for public consumption. At least that is the, the moral sense mm. that we have carved for ourselves as a nation. And so uh, these days, my understanding is that setting television stations show these things at night yes and i say my understanding because quite frankly i haven't seen it myself one is coming um, to accept i mean one television station yes, but it's there they say they, they, yeah they, they say they, they say they, they show it and they'll continue showing it the, the evidence has been has been has been brought mm -hmm. you know through the people who have complained about it and so um 
they have petitioned the National Media Commission to say that it offends public morality and our sense of Ghanaianness and so on, and therefore it should stop. They brought us a copy. Yes. You know that it is no longer government's business to regulate media content. Mm -hmm. It is the business of the National Media Commission to do so. I have had, ever since they brought me a petition, I've, I've spoken to the National Media Commission. They have acknowledged receipt of, of the petition. Um, what they are going to do is that they are going to write to these television stations and remind them of the guidelines. The National Media Commission has setting guidelines, you know, for regulating media practice in Ghana. And one of the uh, the articles or clauses of, of those um, regulations states explicitly that the showing of such content is offensive. Now, from my discussions with the National Media Commission, um, my sense is that guidelines are not law. Exactly. Okay. So to the extent that guidelines are not law, it will be, in my view, uh, very difficult um, if the people insist that no law explicitly prohibits them from doing what they are doing, especially so because they are doing it past midnight and so on. Um, the cure for all of these will be a national broadcasting law. Mm -hmm. The National Media Commission itself tried to cure this some time back with what was then called the LI-2224, um, which sought to say that the National Media Commission should be empowered you know, to censor certain content, certain media content. The Ghana Independent Broadcasters Association went to court against LI-2224 and won. Uh, and when I say winning, what it means is that the Supreme Court held that some of the provisions of LI-222 um, offended the rule... Amounted to censorship. Exactly. Something the Constitution speaks about. Exactly. For, for you personally, do you think it's right for these stations to do so, personally, in your opinion? Well, in my opinion, it is not right. In, mm -hmm. in my opinion, I have said that... Um, matters of pornography and, and, and all of those things are private adult material in my view. So they mm -hmm. are material that if you are an adult, you are above 18 years. Because I believe that even if you were to go in, onto the internet to access pornographic material, every internet site would want to be sure that you are an adult. They mm -hmm. would ask that are you above 18 and so on. So the point is that it is general agreement around the world that such material is adult material. That's number one. Now, when you come to the African context, um, sex is hedged in Africa. <laughs> okay. So to the extent that sex is also hedged will, will mean that in, in our African setting, it is not correct to show that material. Yes, but if there isn't demand for it, they wouldn't be showing it. I don't know whether you can talk about demand past 12 midnight. I'm not sure that there is more than, I, I, don't, I don't have figures, but I'm not sure that more than 10% of the population would be awake after 12 midnight to watch television. If, if, even if 10%, I'm not exaggerating. I'm sure perhaps less, less, far, far, far less than that of the population will be awake. Well, because, so I mean, I'm not sure that it well, is, it is mean, a demand Are the universities, for instance, just to chip this in, yes. are the universities, for instance, uh, what many of the guys called R18, you had lots of guys staying up late to go and watch it on DSTV at the time. They, they, they called it R18. Okay. Really? Oh, yes. Okay. R18. I mean, yes. I mean, all the guys who are watching, and they know this, R18. And Ice TV has come out to say, and there were a lot of conversations on Facebook, for instance, people started by saying, do you know they show pornography at this time? And then it caught up and people began tuning in. And that's, maybe we're just, you know, some of us, yes, do not like it. But there are, a lot, there, there are some also who like it. And a bit about children, they argue that after midnight, who gets to watch that? Well, 
it may be true that after 12 midnight, children aren't awake or are not supposed to be awake because you cannot guarantee that firmly. Because these days there are children in GHS and so on who also learn at night, who wake up to burn mm -hmm. the midnight candle and, and so on. So we cannot also guarantee totally that um, at midnight children are awake. That's why in other jurisdictions, okay, this particular content is called, it's on pay TV, okay, so that adults who have access to a credit card or a debit card and want to watch porn. In, in that sense, it may not even have to be midnight. In the private of your home, if you think that your children have gone to school and so on, you can pay and access that search material and watch. Search material generally around the world is not free to air. And that's, and that's the problem. Search material generally is not free to air. It, it is on pay TV. And so even if we were to say that they have the right to air that content, it, it is better if it was on pay TV rather than if it was a, a free to air program. Mm -hmm. Well. We'll come back and talk about the issues some we'll find out how we can deal with this and issues of the broadcasting law that you talked about. Still live on Hot Issues with me, Winston Amman. My guest this afternoon is the Minister of Information, Honorable Mustafa Hamid. we go for a short break. Stay with us. All right, so welcome back from that short break, and thanks for staying with us. This is Hot Issues, and my guest this afternoon is the Minister of Information, Honorable Mustafa Hamid. So how do we deal with it? What is the ministry? What is the government going to do? Well, as I said, we are operating under the 1992 Constitution. Mm -hmm. And as I said, the 1992 Constitution um, puts media content regulation firmly in the hands of the National Media Commission. In fact, the, the, the Constitution actually states that the National Media Commission is meant to insulate state-owned media against governmental control and so on. That's even state-owned state, state -owned media. And so we, it, it does not lie within our remit as Ministry of Information to directly deal with this matter. However, we can talk to the stakeholders in the media industry. Ghana Independent Broadcasters Association, for example, uh, National Media Commission, even PrimPag, and so on. There are bodies that are, if you want, associations or organizations of media houses that mm -hmm. we can appeal to, to appeal to their memberships, you know, um, to refrain from doing some of these things. But then the National Media Commission, uh, I'm coming, then the National Media Commission can deal with the law aspects of it. But I, as I said, they also have their hands a bit tight because their LI, LI2224 has been thrown out of the window. And therefore, there is no solid law as we speak um, based on which they can explicitly stamp out this. Now, it is in our calendar, you know, to send the broadcasting law to Parliament next year mm -hmm. for passage. Um, because this year, we are concentrating on getting through the Freedom of Information Bill or law. And then next year, we deal with, with the broadcasting law. So hopefully, when we get to the broadcasting law and we succeed in getting it passed, you know, we would have proper regulation for what it is that people can broadcast and what it is that people cannot broadcast. But as I said, until that, until that time comes, you know, we, we, we are sort of handicapped a bit. Mm. And the right to information bill, when would it be passed, all things being equal? That's why I said, per the calendar that we have rolled out, we are hoping that next year, that will be passed. And on, earlier on the year, you told us by July it should be passed. No, no, I said right to information. Yes, right to information by yes. July this year. Yeah, I said Parliament has resumed. So in this parliamentary session, the right to information will be We're getting the into bills. July. Would it be passed? I said that it will be one of the bills that mm -hmm. will be debated this parliamentary session. And then so in the course of that, it will be debated and passed. So this year, 
we hope. Well, possible. now that I have you, there's some you know uh, issues that we've had, and, and it's just good we have you so we can get clarification from it. We're told ministers haven't been paid so far. Is that true? <laughs> yes, that's true. Why? I don't know. I guess that um, the processes for getting these things done takes time. You know, the whole process is about um, controller and accountant generals and all those things and so on. I mean, it's become a phenomenon. It's not a very good phenomenon in our country that people get employed and after one year they have not they are not taking salaries yet and so on. It happens with teachers, nurses, etc., etc. So if it's happening with politicians, maybe uh, we should say, well, it's good that it's happening to them so that when they also feel the page, mm. they will work hard to correct the anomaly for all, all of us uh, citizens. But so, so how are you surviving then? You're working and uh, a lot of pressure on you. How are you surviving? It's Have you been surviving over the past uh, four or five months? Well, it's, it's been difficult, just like all other people manage to survive by the grace of uh, friends and, and associates and, and so on. We are managing to get by. Except that for politicians, sometimes Ghanaians fear that uh, that could lead you into being compromised by somebody. Well, of course, I wouldn't say that that fear um, is entirely unfounded. So I hope that um, the authorities are working hard, the res people who are responsible for ensuring that these things happen, get them to happen as quickly as possible. Were you surprised when your name was not included in the list of cabinet ministers? Well, I'm neutral. I, I, I wouldn't say I was surprised or not surprised. I mean, because um, composing a list of 19 uh, cabinet members out of um, 36 which the president named, um, I must confess, would be a very difficult uh, task for any president at all. And therefore, if you are amongst the 36, you know that you can either be in or not be in. And, and so you don't have to either be surprised or not surprised. I'm not sure it's a matter that we either have to be surprised about or not surprised about. So I'm, I'm, I'm indifferent. Mm. What do you make of the security of the state so far? Well, I think that the security of the state, it's, it's good. Um, even though I must admit that there's a certain perception out there that uh, there's a certain um, state of insecurity, okay? Um, but that may not reflect the reality. And in my view, it doesn't reflect the reality. Um, there have been three isolated incidents you know, that have tended to heighten uh, this, this perception. So the security agencies are working very hard to ensure that these types of incidents don't happen so that, you know, the general security that we feel um, is, is not compromised on the altar of the perception that people are not secure. But quite frankly, I believe that this country is quite a peaceful place to live in right now. Well, there's lots of uh, issues here. But uh, the family of the police who was also shot, they're calling for state burial. They're calling for similar treatment. Would that be accorded them? Well, I, I, I haven't um, received formal notification. You are the one hmm. just telling me. That's number one. Number two, I, uh, the authority is not vested in me to make those kinds of, of decisions. So I'm sure their petition will be directed perhaps through the Minister for Interior, who is responsible for police uh, uh, people and so on. And when that comes up as a formal request, I'm sure they will look at the, all the implications and the ingredients that qualify for such treatment and then the appropriate decision will be taken. I'm not sure it lies within my capacity to, 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 to make that pronouncement. Mm. I know that the, I mean, uh, the bill for the creation of the special prosecutor is in Parliament. Who and who are in there to get it? To get what? To be the special prosecutor. Who's oh, okay. likely to That's get that? That's another prerogative of the president. You are his minister until, of information. Yeah, but if he doesn't, he hasn't announced something formally. It's it's not my business. Has the choice been to, made? Uh, maybe in, in his mind he has an idea who he wants, but it's not something that he has communicated to me and mandated me to put out. Or but it's not course, something uh, that you should tell us now? Of course, I shouldn't tell you. That yes. one, of course I shouldn't. Great. Yeah. I get that point. Yeah. All yeah. things being equal, when is that announcement going to be made? 
Well, when the law is, is done, being passed and everything, um, my understanding is that 28th, 29th, there's a national consultative forum on, on the bill itself. So when that is done, then the parliament passes it and it becomes law. Then at that point, the president is clothed with the power to make that appointment and then he will make the appointment and we'll get to know what are the ideas in his head as to who qualifies to fill that position. Finally, before we wrap up, what do you make of outgoing governments signing contracts sometimes just one week before the exit office? Well, of course, my view is that it's, it's not decent. Um, even though you would, we would recognize that your mandate has not expired until it has expired. <laughs> mm -hmm. What it means is that every president has a mandate to govern the country until January 7th. I mean, uh, of every four years. And so if it is not January, if it is January 6th, the president is legally in charge of the country and that government is legally in place and therefore um, have legal authority to transact business on behalf of our country. However, the convention is that immediately you lose an election, okay, that you no longer engage in activity that binds the incoming government. It's, it's a matter of convention. It's not a matter of law. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I would expect that every government would respect that convention, if for nothing at all, for the sake of mutual respect, for, for, for decency, and for, if you want, order. On those principles, I am against governments, after they have lost elections, continue to sign contracts. So what happens to the contracts they sign? Oh, they are, they are legal contracts. They, they, they are binding on the state. They were signed by a government that was clothed with the authority to do that. They have legal force, and therefore, they are, they are valid. So in this case, all the contracts that were signed by the previous administration, they are binding on the current one? They are, ex unless, of course, you, you, the government finds out that some of the contracts were signed contrary to law. Hmm. Are you following me? Yes. That perhaps they didn't follow the public procurement processes, that there were fishy deals. Once those ones are established, yes, then you can abrogate the contract based on, on matter of law. Mm. But if, if, if they were clean, there were transparent processes for signing those contracts, and those contracts came about as a result of transparent legal processes, every government is bound to go by them. And so if vehicles are purchased by the previous administration for the current administration and they went through the right process, it is binding. Oh, absolutely. Including the 43 vehicles. If right now I haven't examined the contract, but if the contract was valid, duly given, duly signed, properly executed, it is binding. The government would have no choice but to take those cars. Finally, have you found all the stolen vehicles? You have that information? <laughs> well, I, I, I guess that the, the work of the tax force hasn't come mm. to finality. If it comes, the chief of staff who set it up will make another formal announcement that the work of the tax force to retrieve vehicle has come to an end. In the process, this is how many vehicles that we have received. Until that point, we cannot preempt that conversation. Honorable Mustafa Hamid, thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. All right, so that's all for us, uh, from us this afternoon. Hot Issues, we're joined by the Minister of Information, Mustafa Hamid. Thank you so much for watching us. Make sure you make a date with me on Monday on 3FM 92.7 from 5.55 a.m. to 10 a.m. My name is Winston. I'm on behalf of the team. Have a lovely weekend.